Assalamu alaikum rahmatullah. Hope everybody is doing well. Alhamdulillah. So we're going to continue on in our uh, series that we've been talking about the seven big obstacles on the path to Allah. And we're on a last time, uh, um, just as a kind of quick recap. So far, the first big obstacle that we covered was knowledge and the importance of prioritizing knowledge before one gets active in their path to worship. Because if you and I worship without knowing, um, we won't be performing the worship correctly. We won't be practicing the religion uh, correctly. And then uh, that may or may not have any value um, with regards to acceptance. The second, then, when someone realizes and starts to learn is this, this uh, impulse that comes in to, to repent and to, to really realize the level of mistakes that we've made, to turn to Allah in sincere repentance. And so that's the second big hurdle that the traveler on the spiritual path is going to face. So it's knowledge and then it's repentance. And now he's getting into kind of like smaller hurdles, what he calls impediments, of which there are a few in the section that we're in. Um, and so one of them we talked about last time is the dunya and everything the dunya contains and the lure of the dunya and the lure of wealth and the world and prestige and fame and power and, um, and, and all of the things that will tempt someone with the dunya. I talked about the ways to... So the second, now what we're going to get into for today is um, the impact that the people we associate with have on us and on our spiritual state. So uh, this is this is really really important because um, all of us we have people we interact with, whether we interact with them um, at work, whether we have friends that we interact with, um, and, and and acquaintances and, and others. And there there is a spiritual impact that sometimes we're not aware of, um, and other times we are that people are having on us. So the first thing I'm going to just mention before we get into section is, again, all of this depends on the level of practice that someone desires to have when it comes to their spiritual path. That everybody's level of practice is going to be different. And so your standards for how much you apply this are going to be different. The majority of what we're talking about, the majority of, of it is not um, uh, obligatory or haram, right? But that, that is a different category. What we're talking about now are virtuous things for someone to do when they are really trying to get close to Allah and really trying to have a state where in this life they've achieved a state of tranquility and nearness to Allah and that allows them to achieve, achieve inshallah, the higher stations in the next life. And so just, just, just want to set that context because um, you and I need to decide how much we apply, what it is that we're discussing and learning um, to to, to our own uh, life. And, and um, for anybody who has the text, I don't know if anyone's following along in the text, we're going through the text, Minhaj uh, al-Abidin by Mazali. But the section in the text is very, um, you, you could say intense for the time that we live in. Like it's, it's we're basically, again, I'm trying to gonna give, give a lot of context to it. So if you are following along in the text, just be mindful that that is meant, usually what he's describing is meant for someone who's like devoted their entire life to, knowledge and to the path of like scholarship and spiritual travel and that won't really apply to us and so we have to basically make sure that it applies to us in the context it is that we live in alhamdulillah um and everybody will be at a different stage in this so someone if we're still for example working on getting down our five daily prayers and we're still trying to pray those consistently on time then this will apply different and the type of hang out with will apply differently than someone who's at a state where they're constantly vigilant about every thought that enters their heart and trying to prevent any negative thoughts that may distract them from Allah for even a few minutes um, from entering the heart. There's like different parts of the of the spectrum here. And so um, that's that's kind of going to keep in mind. So um, with that, let's start with the impact that people have on us. And this there comes in various um, narrations in, uh, in, in, in ayahs of the Quran as well. Um, in general, the people we associate with, that we hang out, with that we spend time with that we, whose company we are in we will be spiritually impacted by them even if we think that we won't because the way this works is there's an outward effect and an inward effect outwardly you and i see what someone is doing we see what someone is not doing and that may impact our understanding of um, our own religious practice or impact our own understanding of what it is that we want to do but inwardly there's also an impact so people of and light just by being in their presence you might not even exchange words and that light impacts your heart and it impacts your 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 spiritual state and this is 
Um, and there's there's various uh, ways to, to kind of discuss it. The most important example is the impact of the Prophet وسلم, that his light was so overwhelmingly powerful that just being in his presence completely transformed someone, even if they, they never got a chance to properly leave to him, because there was so much nur emanating from his heart. And then that nur was transmitted to the Sahaba, and it was similar, and such that it was it was at the point where even some of the scholars, for example, when one of the great scholars, uh, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al Arabi, he walked into the presence of Imam Ghazali for the first time. Imam Ghazali was in his spiritual retreat. He had kind of retreated away from the world for a period of time to work on himself. And he wasn't seeing that many people um, at this time. And it was like he said that it was as though the, it was the first time I'd ever seen the sun rise. It's like as though the sun had risen over for me with how much light was present and that the experience and the overwhelming. Um, positive spiritual experiences he had when entering the, the presence of this great imam. And this is one of the great scholars of the ummah, not, of course, at the level of the sahaba, or, of course, at the level of the Prophet Wasallam. And so the spiritual state will always be somebody. And someone is either in a spiritual state of light, a spiritual state of darkness, or somewhere in between. There's different types of hearts that are, um, that, that are out there. You have the heart of a pure, sincere, purified believer, which is upright, and it's filled with light. You have the heart of the, the disbeliever who, who knows the truth but covers it up. That heart is completely dark. Um, and then you have the heart of the hypocrite who knows that, that it's out there but doesn't want to do it. Um, and that heart is upside down. And it's flipped upside down. And then there's hearts in between in terms of the level of light or darkness that, 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 that exists. Imam Ghazali describes this in his book, The Marvels of the Heart. So this now, the, the impact of that person the, the heart that they have will impact our state, being in their presence. And um, it's, we can't see someone's heart. We can't see their spiritual state. But what you evaluate on, not in an arrogant, judgmental way, but you evaluate on is the actions that someone does and whether or not it will, it will affect us positively or negatively to spend time with them. And knowing, just being in their presence or watching their, their, their you videos on YouTube or TV shows that they're in, or it will impact us, especially if we begin to develop a longing and attachment to them. Whoever the heart is long is, is attached to and really thinks a lot about, that person will, will impact that heart. That will impact your state. Um, that's why the people who are constantly thinking about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they're constantly that yearning to be with him and to, to meet him and to and, and they have this love for him, that their state starts to develop a sunnah type of character, that they develop a a, a uh, prophetic character to the way that they approach things because the, the Prophet ﷺ is the one who they look up to the most and the one who is their, their role model. Uh, so the spiritual state will impact you. The second though is outwardly. So now let's say that you and I are with someone and they minimize what Allah has made important. And that does happen often. So, so, so prayer time comes in, it's Muslims. And it's like, ah, it's not a big deal, it's fine. We gotta watch the games, the Super Bowl, there's playoffs or whatever, whatever, whatever. And next thing you know, prayer time's gone. And nobody can and now the person you you and I are gonna think, well, hold on a second. They're also Muslim. They didn't pray. Why do I gotta do it? Is it really that big? If not if nothing has happened to them, what's what's the big deal if I don't do it? One what's one prayer going to, going to do? Is it the subtle impacts that start to happen on the heart? And we we are affected then by the state of somebody. And if I, a significant percentage of people minimize something, we may be at risk of minimizing it. And when somebody who we're hanging out with who is a positive influence, when they magnify something that we don't even think is a big deal, but it, it's a big deal, and we're like, we learn from it. We're like, oh, that I, I didn't even realize that I shouldn't be doing that. I didn't even realize that that could have an impact on me. But they'll they'll teach us and they'll magnify things and and they'll do it usually with gentleness and with lutf and with subtle uh, with subtleness. Um, but that is uh, one of the things that, that will happen. So we, we may fall haram, or, or in this case, we may, we may minimize something that we're supposed to do. The, another thing that will happen is we may fall into something impermissible, into something haram. So it's, it's very easy. In fact, many times someone doesn't even want to do a certain sin, but if everyone around them is doing it, they're like, eh, it's fine. Like, you will fall. Peer pressure is a very, very real concept. And it's a very, very real thing that happens. So we may fall into the hum because we see everyone else around us doing something impermissible and we're like, oh, it's fine. It's not, it's not, um, you know, the, the, the end of the world. Um, so that's, that's one category. We're falling into haram. The second one, which I mentioned, is minimizing the haram in our mind. So 
seriousness of missing a person is a really, really, really big deal. Like it's, a, it's, it's, it's for the person who's taking the spiritual path seriously, they should, they should apply some of the talk about missing the prayer and the, extra, the, the significance of it seriously. For people who are um, that not even pray at all, it's better if they focus more on things that will motivate them to pray. And this is where context is really important why we're talking about where someone is at in the spirit. But it's important for someone to know if you are taking the path seriously, that there are hadith with Prophet mentions, the person who misses a prayer, it's the, the difference between us and the kuffar is the prayer. And various scholars have had the opinion in the religion of Islam, credible scholars, including the Hanbali Matha, that missing the prayer will take you out of the fold of Islam. Like that is what sin it is. But it's not the dominant view and it's not the view of, of the vast majority, but it's important to know that that's there. You don't want to tell someone who's not praying at all that opinion because that will um, really demot demotivate them. But for someone who is like, oh, I take it lightly, that should be, we should discuss, we should mention that to ourselves so we start taking it more seriously, right? But these are things which are important to know because it will impact the type of people it is that we um, hang out with. There's other categories where we may a desire to do something um, that will impress other people. So, so this could be in a religious context or in a worldly context. But like, it's very normal for the human being to want the recognition and the praise and the attention of other, of the, of other human beings. But spiritually, that's a disease of the heart. If it's done for religious reasons, it's called riya, ostentation, where someone is trying to get like, you, 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 someone might be you're fasting and you're hanging out with a group of people and it might be like an extra nephil fast and you'll find a way very subtly to slip it in there so someone can know that you're fasting and so they can praise you and say, mashallah, oh, you're doing an extra fast. Really great. It's great to know. And you, you know, just like, oh yeah, I'm just so hungry today. And you'll find a way to slip the nephil, we'll find a way to slip something in that guy. That's on the religious side. On the normal side, on the worldly side, someone might just want people's attention and they might do things but with uh, people, we, someone flex or they think it's called, you're flexing, right? You're literally like trying to show off something to get attention. That's looked down upon in our deen. We don't, Muslims, we shouldn't be doing that um, for the most part, right? Uh, but but th that's another impact that it may have. So there's varying degrees of impact that the company we keep will have on us. And um, Imam al Ghazali's biggest point in this first section is that the company and the wrong people will distract you from Allah. And so if you know that it's distracting you from Allah, you you and I need to minimize it until we're ready to hang out with people again and hopefully be a means of um, helping ourselves and helping them get closer to Allah. But if we are if we are distracted from what we are created to do, to get closer to Allah and to worship, and there are people who are impacting us in that way, then we need to second uh, we need to we need to evaluate um, whether or not. Wise to hang with, with those people, and this this is again we're going to get into some of the details, but like it doesn't apply to family and um, uh, like blood relationships because blood relationships you have no choice. Have to you, you can't you can't you can't distance from blood relationships. But these are relationships where you have a choice, and where we have a choice, we can say, eh, we're not the best group of friends to be with right now, right? They're probably a group of friends I should avoid for a good period of time, um, and then uh, maybe maybe at some point I could try to be a um, that, that hopefully a, a better influence on them. But we all, all know, you know when, when that will happen. And so the Prophet he said in Abid that the um, being with good company uh, is like, for example, if someone is hanging out, out with the, the musk, the person who makes perfume or cologne or something like that, where even if you don't engage in making the perfume, you'll walk away smelling good and you'll walk away having an Enjoy the pleasant smells uh, of that, right? And he said that being in bad company is like the person who is a blacksmith, which, you know, we don't really hang out with, with blacksmiths much anymore, so it's a little bit harder to understand in our time. But, the, you know, the, but the one who is um, that constantly around uh, iron and coal and these types of things, and he says that you either they'll burn your clothes or you'll walk, walk away with, with, like, dark sun on you and with a bad smell. Right, because of the, the nature of that environment. He's not commenting on like the, the prestige of those occupations or anything like that. This is simply just to help us, as a metaphor, understand good company versus bad company. But really what's happening is that it's the spiritual state of that person and the actions that they do that will impact us. That will impact us and that will impact us at the heart, heart level. And then the heart is either begins to be transformed in a positive way or begins 
is to be transformed in a negative way. And so we just need to um, need, need, need to keep that in mind. And Allah says in the Quran that Ya you Ladin Aldibilam Ya you Ladin Amanu, Ittaqullah, Bakunu Ma Sadiqin. That he commands us that oh you who believe have uh, mindfulness of Allah and be with the people of truth, with the Sadiqin. He didn't even tell us you have to be a person of truth. He said just be with the people. We should be truthful, but from the status of the Sadiqin, that be with them. Because being with somebody in a group of people will help us, will help us, and it will be a means of bringing us closer and closer to um, the, the, the to Allah. So um, now we're going to kind of get into a few of the, the categories of people that we should, um, or, or, or traits that someone might have or a group might have that we should work on um, you know, avoiding. So the first is that in terms, this is in terms of like we're hanging out with people willingly, right? There's unwilling and there's willing. Unwilling you're at work, coworkers, Etc. I mean, that's that's. There's only so much you can do, right? But then there's like the friends we make intentionally, and the people we want to hang out with and be present with intentionally. The first is that um, those who just openly disbelieve in Allah or who are unsure about their belief, that will have a very negative spiritual effect on somebody. Um, and so the 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 approach here should be that we avoid friendships, relationships, and and having make, in, intentionally making company with. People who are not believers or who, or who openly disbelieve, right? And um, sometimes it's a little bit hard to, to accept that um, because we are in a society in which uh, it's it's very, very similar society. The vast majority of people don't believe, especially in the Bay Area. But it's important for someone's own preservation. Again, we're talking here about this is not halal or haram. This is not haram to be with someone like this. It's simply the impact it's going to have on your spiritual state. Why is that? It's because you might go through something and you might be trying to process it from a spiritual lens. You might be like, I wonder what God is trying to do. You know, well, for example, right now tech, unfortunately, just tens of thousands of people are being left across every big tech company. Right now, someone who's a believer might be like, okay, Allah is testing me. Perhaps there's some, and you're going to try to find the wisdom in that if, you, if someone was affected by, by losing their job. But someone who doesn't believe in Allah, you're trying to talk to them about, about that and you're like, perhaps Allah is testing me. And, and they're just like, dude, no, it's just the economy. I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean God is testing you? Like, they're not, not going to understand. They're, it's the economy. And it's all, you know, Google's fault. They're Meta's fault. It's all this person. They, they, they won't see Allah as the ultimate one responsible for our risk. And that, yes, it is a means, that the means in this situation is the economic circumstances. Um, that's the sabab. But at the end of the day, the, um, the one who is doing all this is Allah. And so you and I are trying to process and we're like, yeah, you know what? It is that. It's all that, and then we're just going to start to get like confused, and we're not going to. And our belief system, where we might lean towards making du'a more and trying to be more patient, we'll just be like, we won't even engage in those things because we'll just be like, okay, well, I'm 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 not inclining towards the system of belief that I am am am, am, am uh, you know, was raised with or have been uh, taught. Rather, I'm just going to go with whatever philosophy someone else has, and this is where philosophical worldviews become really really important. Um, in our religion, everything it is that we believe will impact how we view the world. Everything. And that's why when someone's spiritual state, they start to work on their spiritual state, their iman will impact, the light of their iman will impact how we see everything that goes on around us. And if someone does not have a religious belief, there's some philosophy that they're prescribing for, for, to, to, right? It's like either you philosophize or someone else philosophizes for you. For us, the belief here is, is our religion. It's Islam. But for other people, it, they might be um, capitalism, maybe the philosophy that they follow. It might be consumerism. It might be um, that, uh, an, 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 you know, uh, they might, liberalism might be another one. Any, any ism that they might follow, that, that might be the worldview that they prescribe to. Now, if that starts to impact us and it starts to seep into our worldview and it's against the teachings of our worldview, that starts to get dangerous. And so, again, you see these are very, very subtle things, but that's why the disbelief can be so dangerous to the believer. Um, and I remember someone was asking me once, I think, online about uh, that should they spend time debating with um, atheists? And they were like, it's starting to impact my faith. Because he, would, he, he, he was like, yeah, the arguments are, I don't know how to respond to the arguments. And so if you don't know how to respond to the arguments, it make you think that you don't have, you know, your faith doesn't have the arguments. But the, the answer was like, you, we're not qualified to have those types of debates for the most part. We're not, we're theologians, right? And so they should 
let's leave those debates to them. Don't engage with people, even in a in an attempt to you're trying to do that way, but they're not going to listen at the end of the day, and it might end up impacting your faith. It might end up impacting someone's iman. So that's the first category: is to be very, very, very careful here. Um, and someone might be at a point where they are, um, for example, we would say like, well, what about the Prophet and the Sahaba? Right? They they did they 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 obviously were trying to do that what to the wider Arabian Peninsula, and then they went out throughout the world. Um, you then have to know what level is your stake. Either you are impacted or you are impacting. So you have to okay, am I in a position now where I can be one who is giving guidance, and ideally I'm that hopefully impacting them in a positive way, or am I getting impacted? And perhaps Allah might make us the means that someone to be hanging out with someone who's a, who doesn't believe, and then they might you might guide them to the religion, or you might guide them to start thinking about God, and then eventually one day, inshallah, that, that Allah will guide them. That could happen, but it's not advised at the beginning stages of the spiritual path to think that that's going to happen, because um, we may get confused, we may get negatively impacted, and the first priority for the believer, especially for the person who's tra traveling the spiritual path, is to protect themselves. That's the first priority that Allah says that uh, 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 to save yourselves and your family from the fire. He starts with yourself and then your family right, before going on and considering you know, any, anybody else. The second is anyone engaged in like really obviously major sins, right? So the, the categories here would be looking. Um, uh, smoking, partying, clubbing, right? Like this, just anybody who, while they're engaging in those, those things, right? Or if they spend a lot of time talking about those things. So if you have a group of friends that went out, you know, someone has a group of friends that went out clubbing over the weekend and then you're hanging out with them on, you know, Sunday or whatever, and they're just talking about what they did, that's going to impact us. It's going to, and what it's going to do is, number one, you're gonna, that there is a sense for someone might be like, uh, wait, what? what like, they won't, they won't like it, but they'll feel impacted. Like, wait, 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 I don't do that. How come I don't do that? And you start to have open questions or shaitan might have what's up. Or on the other side, you'll just turn it, you'll just, someone will just become like arrogantly judgmental. Be like, oh, dang, you're still doing that. Like, I'm way past that. Like, you'll just, someone will start becoming, and that's also not good because that will impact your spiritual state in the opposite direction where you think you're better than somebody. You, this is not, none of this is assuming that we're better. This is all assuming we're weak and we're so weak that anyone's state will impact us negatively. This is not with the assumption that, oh, I'm better than somebody, so I can't hang out with them. That's the opposite of the spiritual path. The spiritual path is about humility and, that, um, and submissiveness before. Um, before. And so you, we, don't, we don't, in this, turn into like the, the haram police or things like that. That's not the goal. The goal is focus on yourself and avoid anyone who is going to have a negative impact. So that one is pretty, um, pretty clear. It's just like we, we, we know if someone is constantly caught up in those things limit the engagement to like events in which you they probably won't be talking about that and right? some type of more public event or something like that and you just you just you just okay how's it going or like a group dinner with a bunch of friends and and it's just kind of very very much like that's not going to be the topic of conversation obviously not engaging with them in, in those types of um, in those types of things the third one and this definitely will um apply to, to us is like people who they just really like to gossip and it just gets a little too much and now there's no way to back out because most of us are too shy or don't know the right tactful way to tell someone to stop backbiting we're just not and but that really just both the person saying it and the person listening have the sin because it, it takes a listener for the person saying it to the one person's not going to like sit in front of the mirror I mean, some really crazy people might but most people want to sit in front of the mirror and talk bad about others they need someone to listen so this one is is um, important to remember that it's it's advice it's um, we have to protect our own state and we can't hang out with people who this is the main thing that they do again if someone might slip we're gonna all slip into backbiting at some point in our life and we hope we have friends or loved ones um, or family members etc who will correct us and who will gently bring us back but I'm talking here about like the dominant state. Like more than 50% of the conversations or 40 to 50% of the conversations are about other people. And it usually starts off not like that. Like, how's so-and-so doing? Oh, yeah, they're good. You know, like, uh, yeah, he's good. You know, he, he, he recently got a new job. And like, I don't know how he got a new job. He's stupid. They'll just still, they'll come. Maybe not that. But like, they'll, they'll, it'll be very, very, like, it'll start a little bit subtle. And the next thing you know, it'll ramp up and get to the point of like just dissing on their character. 
and you're like, wait, what, what's the, what, why, why did that need to happen? Right? But at that point, we might be absorbed in it and we might, might be contributing to it. Oh yeah, that happened, that happened. And then the minute someone tells you, can't tell you something about this, you, you, you should know that person should be avoided. That's a very dangerous person. And if you and I are that, that person who likes to hear the latest news about people, ooh, we are in a very, very precarious state. Because that's a very, very easy inroad for shaitan to pollute communities and to pollute um, groups of friends and to pollute relationships. All it takes is, and I, I know some, just the other day someone was telling me that someone else in their family told them something about some, something that they said to like a rishda or something that they were offered and it just like created bad opinion of them and then the person who told them this you know family member has a bad opinion of you now i'll create a damage between that relationship all because one person decided that they had to relay the news of what someone else did and that's called namima in our religion um, uh, um tail bearing and it's very dangerous it's it's it's, it's likely it's like liba but worse it's like backbiting but worse just to kind of spread gossip about people so if we're in that state we know already we have of work to do. We talked about this in the section of, um, of repentance. But if we are affected by, by people in this state, or if, if we're around people in the state, this one is pretty clear. There's not really a, a way around it. You just kind of have to leave leave that that, that, that that group. And you have to minimize the hanging out with them. And, and it takes tact. They might, you might have someone who all they do, and this includes like talking bad about anyone in their life. Someone could just hit you up and all they want to do is talk bad about their mother-in-law. You're, that's backbiting. It, it, there's not like oh, mother-in-laws are an exception, or you know your boss is an exception. It, no, 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 no. These are human beings, right? Like it's 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 it's, it's still considered backbiting. And so you, you and I now have to remember it will affect your spiritual state. Darkness starts to enter, and laziness and worship kicks in, and the desire to do extra good deeds, the desire to be in a state of fudur and presence with Allah will decrease. Versus people of goodness, and we'll talk about what what qualities to look for, for inshallah. They'll elevate your spiritual. Thing. They'll you'll only hear them tell like good either either stories or or um, that experiences that they've had. Like you'll feel you'll feel lighter walking away. You'll feel a sense of uh, kind of um, elevation and, and and tranquility when walking away from those gatherings. They're usually talking about um, uh, something related to some of the stories of the great pious people or or something beneficial, some something of benefit. Or they're not talking much, but we're just um, listening, and it's nice to also just have people who are going to listen to some, some beneficial conversation. So that's the, the third category. And we're getting more and more subtle. The next one is someone constantly complaining, groups who are constantly complaining. And where it's not as serious in terms of like just leaving it, but if it starts to impact our character, we have to check ourselves and then we have to find gentle ways to explain to that person that complaining is not going to get us anywhere. And there's a difference here between between complaining is defined as someone as, as when we're in a state where we're not, not looking for advice. We're not looking for a solution. We just want to just talk about it. We're just like, oh my God, this happened and this happened. And just we have, and we're like, if someone tries to say, hey, well, have you tried this? Like, I don't care. I don't want to hear that. I just want to, like, I don't, that, that means, okay, we have left the realm of like constructive salt problem solving. And we're now in the realm of complaining. And Allah says in the Quran, like that, that, uh, if you are grateful, I will increase you. But if you are not grateful, uh, Allah says, my punishment is severe. And the scholars, they say that Allah has a physical law. The more grateful gratitude someone shows, and gratitude manifests on the tongue, and it manifests in the body in terms of like, good. if someone is um, constantly praising and thanking Allah for all the blessings that they've given them, Allah gives them more. It's a metaphysical law. If someone is constantly complaining about things in their life and not noticing the blessings, Allah gives them more to complain about. And they'll just, they'll stay in the complaining cycle. And they won't be able to see, like we, especially living in like pretty, very privileged societies in the West with, with well, a lot more than our basic needs met. There's very little that we have to complain about. And again, we might need to get advice from someone, but it's, it's go to anyone who's really struggling in the Muslim world and, um, they'll trade spots with us any day. And so we have to, we have to feel a little bit of, of have adab in front of Allah, that Allah is watching me and I'm complaining about this situation in my life and, and all these negative things when I could be focusing on the positive things. 
And again, this 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 doesn't apply to like you're talking to a therapist or a counselor or, or a someone who can give, give you guidance. You might you might need to like tell them all the negatives that have happened so that you can get guidance from the therapist in therapy. That's that's these are exceptions. We're talking about average conversations where the majority of the topics are about complaining. Here, the goal is you either change the topic, we either change the topic, or we um, find an excuse to kind of leave for a little bit and um, come back when that, that you know, the, the constant complaining is, is over. But if it's like just between two people and you leave, then they'll probably complain about you leaving and get mad. So that's not always going to work. Um, you just have to kind of be wise about how we approach it. The next one is if, if someone curses a lot um, and this is, it's just you can see all of these have to do with the tongue because the tongue really is the the uh, gateway to a lot of the sins that we um, will do. And so, uh, if someone is just constantly dropping different different curse words and they just like there is no control in the tongue, here you have to check that did that affect my heart and did affect have you and have you and I started cursing more because we were around someone like that and it does happen if you're around um like often now in in corporate america people just left and right they just don't care anymore there used to be some manners they just don't care they're constantly cursing so it will affect someone you'll someone will get you'll get mad and then you'll you'll almost say something you'll be like wait hold on a second. that's not this, this is not our way we're not supposed to speak like this but it has an effect and so it becomes even more impactful when it's our friends and everyone is just treating it lightly and, and dropping f bombs here and saying this word and this word and then we're just like we just take it super lightly and 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 it would also apply to like inappropriate sexual innuendos and these types of things that if someone is constantly in a in a state of just inappropriate jokes and that that's not for the spiritual aspirant that's not good company to keep that's not good company to keep and for men if there are people who make misogynistic or inappropriate jokes about women that's that is completely haram and that you should not consider that person a, a, a real man because the Prophet never degraded women. It's not from our tradition. And, and, and usually Muslims don't do this, but there are people, unfortunately, who have this type of, of mindset and this type of approach. And so the respect and dignified conversations are possible, but the culture we live in is full of like jokes about our moms and just, just all sorts of crazy. Oh, no one does that anymore. That was like back in the day. But, but, but uh, I don't think so. But um, it's full of just all sorts of weird things. And you go, you go to a Muslim country, and if someone like says something about your family member, you're going to punch him in the face. It's like you have so much respect for them. You have so much respect for your mom or for your sister or for, for someone like this. Like it's not to be, to be taken lightly. But if we're affected by the wrong type of people, and this does happen in secular societies, I notice often people like really don't like their parents. Like they're like, oh, my God, I got to see my parents this weekend. And, and, and you're non-Muslims, and you're like, and? And like, I gotta go to a family re reunion like most muslims are pretty excited if they're about to go see like you know all their cousins or something like that like, they're gonna have biryani they're gonna hang out they're gonna you know, they're gonna have a good time but many people who are who are who don't have family as a core part of their values they don't like that and now that starts to affect someone else's state you're like yeah why, why, why am i so into this am i am i doing something that's it's like not not cool or not right and it's just very subtle and so you you have to know how firm someone's values have to be firm in order to kind of defend themselves against this um, and then um, the sixth category here is if if a group is just, I think we mentioned this at the beginning, but it's just very lazy with their ibadah, with the worship. So this is where if you can be the one who help, helps establish the prayer in a gathering where no one is establishing the prayer, alhamdulillah. But if you're going to be impacted by no one else establishing the prayer and you're like, oh, well, uh, maybe I should just go over in a corner right, while everyone else is like, you know, doing something else, then that. You, you eventually, after five, 10, 15 times hanging out there, you have to reevaluate whether or not that, that's good for your spiritual state and, and whether or not we are comfortable with, with people who are um, they're not taking this stuff seriously and they're not open to advice here. Right? But it's different. If someone is like able to establish the prayer, that's a very, very, very good thing. And that would be considered um, better than uh, avoiding something like that. But it just depends. You, again, this is what I said in the beginning. Everyone's state is going to be different, and you have to just know where you and I are at with regards to what we can apply and what we can't apply. So that's that's the kind of individual people, and there's many, many, many others. Um, Imam Ghazali in the text, he really gets into um, a lot more 
it's 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 basically being careful about hanging out with anyone who's going to distract you from Allah. And so like it's talking about um, just various categories of people that I think for us, most of us living in the West from the time we live in, it might not necessarily apply. But just in case people are curious, um, there are various hadith of the Prophet, some that are important to mention. So one time um, they mentioned that uh, Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Amr al-As uh, ibn al-As radiallahu anhu says that we were in the company of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa when it was mentioned about fitna, a time corruption in fitna. And he said, if you see that people in general breaking their contracts and their trusts carry very little weight. And um, then he said, then what should we do? And he went on to list a few other qualities, but then I mentioned here. What should they do in that case? And he said, stick to your home and keep your tongue to yourself. Expect what you, uh, accept what you know to be right. Leave what you know to be wrong and adopt the pattern of the elite, meaning this, the spiritual elite, the, the people who are really practicing the religion, like seriously, and discard the pattern of um, what you see the common society doing. Just like, be, because that's not no longer going to be the religious way. Now, it's important to remember the context that the Prophet ﷺ is speaking to is that the Sahaba couldn't imagine groups of people just not wanting to pray. Right? Like, it just, it's just so far from, the, from, from their mindset. They just couldn't see, like, like, a bunch of Muslims hanging out, not wanting to practice the religion. How could that be? who is, is, a, is a Muslim, he has prophecy, so he's telling them about a time that's going to come. And he says that these are going to be the days where you can't trust really anybody around you. You can't trust them with your secrets, you can't trust them with business, you can't trust them with other types of things. Um, and uh, and he says that you, he says that um, you will live, if you are granted a long life, you will live through a time when there are many preachers, very few scholars. Questioners, are many, but few can answer their questions. And he says it will be a time when the Hawa, the caprice, is a director of knowledge. And so he's even warning against it. Again, this is why Imam Ghazali really takes on this kind of um, spin to it when he talks about people of avoiding people who you think are people of knowledge, but they're actually just people who are using their own desires to get something from the religion. Like some people use the religion to become very, very prominent and famous, and um, they're, they're doing it in the name of Quran or in the name of the sunnah and the name of knowledge but really there is a deeper deeper intention so he's kind of talking about that um and he says that when another hadith um, by the prophet وسلم, that when um the salat has been put to death when the ritual prayer has been put to death when bribery has been accepted as the norm and the religion has been told for sold for a tiny slice of the dunya that seek salvation seek salvation and the prophet said woe unto you then again seek salvation seek salvation Ali mentioned is you really just just kind of try to avoid being too intermixed with society, um, like the pandemic when the first hit, where just like everybody's just in a state of being alone um, and chilling in place. And so he's not saying do that entirely, but he's saying be very careful if this becomes the mass corruption in society. But what is he mentioned first? The prayer being put to death, and then second he says that bribery being accepted, and then the religion being sold for a tiny slice of dunya. These are the main things. And this is unfortunately a good portion of the Muslim world, but this is the case where just people, it's a Muslim country, Adhan is going off, no one's praying. And it's common you to get anything done, you got to bribe someone. You got to like pay them a little bit, like they'll wonder what's in it for me, what's in it for me. And if you don't have something in it for them, you better call someone powerful to tell them to get that thing done for you. Otherwise, they won't get, get it done just because it's like their job or something. And then uh, that, uh, the religion has been told, sold for a tiny slice of the dunya. Um, so someone compromising their values because of some money. Uh, again, it could be a bribe or someone compromising their values because of um, something of the, uh, of the dunya, some position or some status or something like that. So that's the, the, the category he's been saying is that if they're going to distract you from worship, be careful. We're talking now a little bit more kind of zoomed out, which is like if someone is going to impact us in the practice of, of, of the religion, then we should be, be, be mindful. Um, but I did want to kind of mention some of the, the narrations here. So the second now gets into gatherings that are going to harm us. So there's there's uh, being with people, and then there's like large gatherings it is that we might attend. So we'll start here by one of the sayings of um, one of the great scholars of our religion, Ibn Atayla Skandri. He says in the Hikam, in his uh, famous aphorisms, that don't keep company. Company means that you, we actually like spend time with them. Right? Don't keep company with anyone whose state does not inspire you and whose speech does not lead you to Allah. 
he's very much directing this again at the person traveling the spiritual path. He's not directing this as saying it's haram or that it's that it's impermissible. But he's saying that if you want to be elevated spiritually in most of your days, right, try to identify people who when you do need social time, you're going to hang out with people who will direct your state to Allah and who will, who will, who will direct um, you and me to Allah and who will inspire us and motivate us. And we've all been there. We've all had a time where we like hung out with a group of brothers or or for sisters, group of sisters that where we feel like, oh man, I'm really feeling like, like, like I can do this. We might be feeling a little down, a little unmotivated, and then we'll hang out with someone and they'll give us some, just a normal conversation or they'll give us some advice and we'll feel uplifted and we'll feel more motivated to, 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 to take the spiritual path seriously. So, so companionship is important, which is why the Sahaba, they're called companions. They all hung out with each other. They would all have times of laughter and joking and relaxing and eating food and this is all normal, but they would, that they knew what their goal in life was. And they knew if I only have 60 or 70 years, roughly on average to live, probably shorter, that I got to make it worth it. And I can't let moments go by where I let a whole year where I was hanging out with the wrong type of people affect me. And then a whole year where I was hanging out, you know, and just it, 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 it adds on, it adds on until next thing you know, we are very, very different than the person we wanted to be. And um, we have to be, you have to be careful. And then he says, and another thing come that you and I might be in a bad state. He says, you might be in a bad state, then associating with someone who outwardly is in a worse state than you makes you see virtue in yourself. Makes you see virtue in yourself. What does that mean? So there's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ told us that, and I think most of us have probably um, heard this from someone, maybe our parents or others, that in, in religion, in matters of religion, we should look to people who are doing more than us. And in matters of dunya, we should look to people who are less privileged than us. That's the, the mindset of the believer. And what does it mean? Look to people who are doing more than people who are doing more worship, who are doing more good in the world, who are doing more form of service, who are, who are have better akhlaq and better character. We should look to them when it comes to matters of religion. Why? Because it will inspire us. And it will make us like, okay, yeah, I can do more. They're doing it. I can do it too, right? And, um, and, and then in matters of dunya, we should look at people who are less fortunate and less privileged. And then we'll feel grateful, alhamdulillah, for everything I have. We flipped it. We're in the, the, the dunya, we're always looking at, oh my God, he has so much money and she has so much money and they're famous and this. And we're constantly, we want more and more and more. And in deen, we're like, well, I'm, at least I'm praying. They're not even praying. So it's probably fine, right? Like we just, we just make, we just kind of balance it out by making it seem like, well, the vast majority of people aren't doing anything. I'm doing something. So I'm probably just fine, like back to doing, you know, back to living life the way I want, right? And that's what, what he's saying here in this hadith that we shouldn't do. And what Ibn Atal al Khandri is saying that you might be already, you and I, and the, we are in bad spiritual states. I mean, like I can speak for myself, at least that there's a lot of work to do. And we know that work that we have and we feel that shy in front of Allah when, when we think about the state of our heart. But he says, if you hang out with someone who's in a worse state, in a worse state, right? then you might start to see virtue in yourself. You might be like, it's not so bad. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah I'm, I'm doing, you know, and, and, that, and, and, and that's not a good thing spiritually. Spiritually, the person is always not in like a self-deprecating way, but in, in like a trying to improve and get to Allah. Some, we should always be like, I got work to do. I got to keep going. I got to keep going. I should never feel content. The one who is content with their spiritual state at that point, it comes to one narration, Allah becomes discontent. And the discontent with their state, Allah is content with them. And so this means here we should never be impressed with ourselves. We should never think of ourselves highly as like, oh, I'm all that. Like I, I did this, and I did that, and all the, all the tricks of the nafs. And we'll get into it later in the book. You'll talk about that Riyah and Ujjub and some of the big, big tricks that will come for the spiritual traveler um, and the way to cure them. Because those are big ones when, when someone starts to worship. They're very subtle. The nafs starts to, oh, you're so great and impressive. And it starts to really make someone, they're, 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 uh, uh, let's blow up their head, right? And um, the, the, the scholars of the spiritual science, they'll just put a pin, pop the balloon, and then bring us back to reality and help us be like, oh, then hold on. It's, it's um, I have to keep, be, be grounded, be grounded. So that's the the impact that people are going to have. So now we think about gatherings, right? And this is, I'm, I'm really kind of tried to make this more about gatherings that um, I feel like are very common in our communities. I might have left some out, 
Um, and I might uh, be talking about ones that, that don't apply to us and, and, and hopefully that's a good thing. So first is like, so again, for the spiritual traveler, social gatherings where there's inappropriate things going on, um, we should avoid. Those are gatherings we should actively try not to even enter into those, those places. So if there's um, uh, active amounts of um, like a party type of atmosphere, where people are smoking, smoking anything, all types of smoking, including hookah are categorically haram in our religion, not permissible. Um, and the, the fatawa for that have been revised from some of the earlier fatawa once they learned the danger of tobacco. And um, because some of the Muslims didn't know um, earlier on that some of the fatawa said that hookah was makru, but it is now like, very clearly haram. Smoking cigarettes is haram, smoking vape pens is haram, um, juice, oh, what's it called, jewel pens, all that stuff. It's all impermissible, right? So if there's like a gathering we go to, and someone has a hookah out and someone else is doing this, someone else is doing that, there's loud music bumping. If you are serious about the spiritual path, you're gonna turn around. Why? It's not because you're better than those people, because there are jinn, shayateen, energies that are gravitating towards those, running, looking for gatherings like this. So the angels, we know in one narration, they run, they, they um, gravitate towards gatherings of thicker, gatherings of knowledge and gatherings of goodness. They love that. They, they, and so you'll feel if you're if we ever are blessed to, to go into a really um, and hopefully in Jumma, this is the case as well, uh, we'll feel a slight type of upliftment because there was so much angelic light that was present in those gatherings that that will impact you and it will enter you. Gatherings of haram or gatherings of darkness will bring jinn and shayateen. And this is where bad problems start to happen to people, like, like spiritual, spiritually negative problems start to happen to people. Because in order to be impacted by um, seher, black magic, which is very real, and we ask that Allah protect all of us and our families and our children from this, but these types of things are real, jinn and shayateen usually need to be present. And if someone is now somebody who the jinn and shayateen, they gravitate towards, they want to be with them, they are uh, constantly around them, then they are more prone to being affected by these negative effects, by these negative impacts. And it's such a time that we live in that there used to be a time when one of the scholars, uh, Habib, uh, uh, that uh, called them a sagaf, he mentioned this recently. There used to be a time when the the, the jinn and the shatin, they were more hidden unless they had like a reason to do something. He said, now is a time as we get closer to the end of time where they're brazen and they're out there looking for people to attack and looking for people like to attach to, to mess with to mess up their family, mess up their marriage, mess up their state, all these types of things. And so we go to these gatherings and we're bringing dark energies and bad things with us back into our homes. And it's a very, very, very real effect. So that's the, the first um, type, of, uh, type of gathering. Um, and the, the second one would be, um, and this, this is uh, very common in, in our communities, is weddings where there's just like, you can very ba barely differentiate that, um, that, that wedding from the wedding of a non-Muslim. That's a gathering in which if you you attend as a, you give the gift, you know you you stay for a little bit, you mingle, and as soon as the haram starts, the person who's traveling the path, they're, they're, they 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 at least they're outside in the main hall or something like that, not in the place um, where everyone else is. But they don't, don't engage because weddings are also the same thing. If if there's haram um, going on and there's haram dancing, women dancing in front of men, mixed dancing going on. It turns into a club, basically, where there's loud music, there's lights, everyone is in the same room together, and that is just the impact that will have on your spiritual state is significant. It's significant. And we have, um, maybe this is just in the Desi community and hopefully not in others, but at least in the Desi community, this is very, this has completely gotten out of control. And it's like you won't even be able to, at the beginning of the wedding, someone will start with Quran and a dua, and then at the end, it ends like this. And you're just like, what? How did, this, what, did what happened here? Right. And nothing means that there's, it's completely permissible to have fun, to have a little music, to have some, you know, some, some, some halal dancing at a wedding, men dancing with men, men, women dancing with women. That's completely permissible and okay at weddings, especially like it's a time of festivity. But the level of intermixing that's gone on and to participate in that is not meant for the person who's taking the path seriously. It's not meant for any Muslim, but unfortunately, in the time we live in, um, it's widely, widely, widely applied. And so, you and I have to be on guard over our spiritual state when we're in these circumstances. If someone has to go to this, like you, you, you got to go. It's a family event. Um, not going will have a worse impact. It may be seen as you cutting ties or something, or you know, reducing ties or something. But then you go seeking Allah's protection from any darkness that will be present there.
because what is one of the fastest ways when men and women are dancing in the same room and there's loud music that the jinn enter and the shayateen enter. Again, it's they, they seek out these types of gatherings. Even worse, that some Muslim weddings now have alcohol being served. And, and, um, and that's like, if you start to see the alcohol come out, any gathering where there's alcohol, we'll talk about happy hours in a second, any gathering with alcohol, get out. As, as soon as it's possible to get out. Not like, ah, and then you throw the cup of wine and someone and you run away. Not that. But um, uh, some people might do that, but that's not wise. You just, you just subtly leave, make your, make your exit. Because the minute you now start to interact with people who themselves are drinking, they're, they're, they're a little bit, you know, they're, they're starting to get a little bit tipsy and then slowly and then their words are slurring. And now, literally, you can I mean, smell it in their breath. It will start to affect you spiritually and physically it will affect you. Like you won't even smell good anymore. Um, and, uh, and so that is like another bad, bad, bad sign. And so someone should now evaluate. Hold on a second. Are the people who I hang out with and the people who invite me to these things, where are they at in terms of their spectrum of what their gatherings look like? There's people who their gatherings are just kind of like, you know, they're doing a few things that probably aren't, aren't the best, but for the most part, they're permissible. And then there's like all the way on the other end of the spectrum where someone is just like, it's you literally can't differentiate between a non-Muslim wedding and um, the Muslim wedding. And then you have some that are like very, very fun, festive occasions, but there's no, no haram going on. There's no, there's no impermissible activity. And there's still festivity and people are still having a good time. But there's respect of, of uh, what, what our religion says um, that we should respect. So we have to be very, very um, careful uh, here. The next one is if someone is still um, that unmarried, Gatherings that will make you really incline and will stir up the desire towards the opposite gender should be avoided for the most part. I'm not saying like you should never hang out with that. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you that if there's a lot of laughing, joking, borderline flirtation that begins between um, a non mehram man and a non mehram woman, that's now a door for shaitan to enter. Eventually, what someone they exchange numbers. Next thing you know, start talking, and most of the time, that unless someone is very sincerely making the intention for marriage, and they make that clear up front, and they have some boundaries drawn in that process of, of like, hey, we're we're really just talking for the sake of getting to know each other for marriage, and they try to do something permissible way. Most of the time, this this will lead to um, fitna, and this will lead to um, inappropriate behavior. And so, you have to avoid what would the Sahaba do? They would avoid. Permissible things, this is this wouldn't mean they're permissible, they would avoid permissible things just so that they couldn't get near haram. They would they would there's one narration 70 degrees between them and, and something haram. They would just be like, I'm not even gonna get close to it. Because if I get close to it, I could potentially fall into it. So I'm just gonna be like way distant. We should at least be and you might you might be someone who's called, you know, you're such a square, you're such a loser, you're such a this, you're like, oh, come on, dude, it's not a big deal. Like, this is gonna happen, or like, you know, for the sisters like someone is going to make us feel like we're not not cool or we're not doing what everyone else is doing. Totally fine. You should know you're good with Allah. You're good. Just don't be arrogant, annoying, and judgmental about it. Don't. That's the big thing. It's like we are not in a place to be like making other people feel low about themselves. The person who's taking their deen seriously is always in a state where we're trying to uplift everyone around us. We're trying to uplift everyone. We should always make them feel um, not like what someone is doing is okay, but never make someone feel hopeless or make them feel judged or low, right? We find excuses to excuse ourselves from the place. I got to go to this. I have something to do. I have a big, you know, um, presentation coming up. I have and you just find a reason to excuse yourself from something like this. But if you know, and you're excited very specifically because you know you're going to have a chance to flirt with someone, you probably shouldn't go. Like that, that, that would be a sign like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm doing the wrong thing. Right, I should probably stay away because the first thing that begins is the zina of the eye. The eye has a zina, has a, has a fornication, and as does every part of the body. And it starts with just looking, and then the gaze turns into something else, and then it turns into something else, and the next thing you know, um, that someone is, uh, that without realizing, caught up in the haram. The next category would be um, navigating uh, that happy hours at work and gatherings where alcohol is present. And now someone doesn't know. This might be for a non for someone who comes from a non-Muslim family and they're invited to a, ga like a, like a family gathering and this is present and you have to be tactful about how you manage that. And for us, that if we're working and we are, um, people are drinking and now they even have like alcohol in offices, but that if someone is drinking 
uh, a lot of people are drinking. We get we we get invited after work for drinks, or there's like a big company event. There's happy hour. Usually now because of COVID, um, these types of things have been minimized, but they still do they do happen. If this is like absolutely essential and obligatory for someone to go to, meaning like your job is on the line and it's like part of, let's say you have a client meeting and you're in the world of consulting and you like have, it's a part of the meeting and they're going to be drinking at the meeting. You go, you seek protection from Allah and you do one of the, one of the protection stickers that we covered in the last class um, beforehand. Now there's, inshallah, there's like four seal that they'll put over you for some period of time that you won't be affected as much inshallah. But if there's, there's, yes. Yeah, so it's, um, there's a few. The strongest one, or one of the stronger ones, is the wear of Imam Noe that I would recommend everybody, um, at least in circumstances where we know we're going to be going into a place that's not good, we do. It's, it's W-I-R-D, Imam Noe, N-A-W-A-W-I. Um, but there's others, and that one takes like five minutes or so to read. Um, you can find it on YouTube, you can just follow along. But it's, it's, it creates like spiritual protection. Right. And at minimum, again, if we don't know, we I took Kursi, the three the three goals, Kulu Allah had Kulu Adrab with Falak Kulu Adrab Nas with presence and asking Allah to protect us. Obviously, we'll, we'll also um, do do it, but these dickers have some strong du'as in there as well. Um, if there is a way out of them, and it's not obligatory, and like we know that a lot of people don't go, it's like if someone has a family and they have to get home to their kids, most of the time they're usually not going to be there for after work things. Um, so there is a way out of them. We find the person who's taking the path seriously, they will not go to these gatherings. They'll be like, nope, I'm not going to go there because it's going to affect someone's iman and, uh, or, or their light rather, their nur, which ultimately impacts their iman. And so you, will, you and I will find ways to avoid those gatherings. And um, alhamdulillah, it's gotten easier in the time of COVID, but I definitely know before it was difficult that there was pressure usually that, to go to after work events where there's alcohol present and someone... It's usually asked if you're the only one not drinking, why aren't you drinking? Um, and then you'll get into a discussion about that. And some people are respectful and others are not that respectful. And then you have to navigate that. And now you're feeling like you're the only one who's not doing something. And then there's just this constant kind of worry that starts to come in. The, the perception to keep in mind here, a lot of people will um, have asked, but, well, what about my career? I have to go for networking. What about my career progress? This is where the, you know, the CEO is going to be there and so on and so forth. Um, at the end of the day, if someone's not obligated to go and you have, you can find an excuse out and you do so for the sake of Allah, you have nothing to worry about. Allah is in control of this entire nizam, of this entire universe. He's in control of our careers, he's in control of our jobs, he's in control of our risk, he's in control of promotions, he's in control of who gets a job, who doesn't, who's laid off. Allah is in control. We have nothing to worry about. So that's where taqwa comes in. Allah will throw these subtle tests out. And as you get closer and closer, as you try harder and harder, the tests become more and more subtle. And they'll just met you from nowhere and you'll be like, oh, uh, someone will be uh, your whole team will come to you and be like, oh, do you, do you want to go for drinks? And then now you're going to be like, what do I do? And you just you have to you have to be in the right state to be like, no, I'm good. I got I got I got to go home and like tend to my family or something like that. And you'll be just fine. No one will think twice about it because they won't even remember because they're probably the memory will be affected by all the alcohol they drink. But even if you remember, the intellect doesn't stay sharp anymore when you drink a lot. So they're, 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 it won't have any impact on you. Like that is guaranteed. Have zero, and no one is going to write it in someone's performance review that oh they didn't come to this happy hour on Tuesday. Like that's not going to that happen. But the taqwa test will happen, and Allah will start to throw these tests at the spiritual tablet. The um, really the I think the final gathering is just one where like you're going to feel lord. But on the last session we talked about the dunya, where you're going to feel like lord into the dunya, like attracted into the dunya. This is not a this is this one is one where you have to be more subtle to avoid gatherings in which everything is about competing with everybody else. So it's like who has on the nice clothes, who has on designer clothes, who has the designer bag, who has the designer car, who has or the fancy car, who has the luxury car, who has the luxury watch, and it's just it's like a, it could be there's no nothing permissible impermissible going on, but the the one who's serious doesn't needs to make sure their eye does not get caught up in those things actually a level of lowering the gaze where the first level of lowering the gaze is lowering the gaze from the haram there's another level of lowering the gaze which is lowering the gaze from the fault of the muslims and there's another level of lowering the gaze where it's lowering the gaze from anything that will lure you towards the dunya. and so you and i if we like see something super like oh my god that's so nice like what a nice watch and we're and and now the heart starts to incline you know i should have a rolex too and you're like how much money do i have saved up i don't have enough for a roll and you start to just think about the rolex and now that becomes like 
your heart is inclining towards a piece of metal, let's just say, right? And and it's insignificant at the end of the day, but it starts to incline. That is for the spirit, nothing haram about it. Nothing haram. Again, we're not talking about haram here. We're talking about spiritual a spiritual path. For the one who's traveling the path, they'll just, you try not to to to, to engage in those types of conversations. When the, the topic is all about the dunya, it's just about like, you know, everyone is just competing with each other. And, um, uh, and, and, and again, not in, an, we should be very, very gentle with how we approach these types of things. Um, and then finally, I, I thought it would be good to add like virtual gatherings because, um, we do have virtual gatherings. So for example, if someone plays a lot of, um, like video games, or there's a lot of like chat rooms now and different apps like discord and, um, you will be affected by the people who you're engaged with in those areas. That, that, that their, their state and what they're doing will affect you. I mean, there's no, there's really not any reason for someone who's really trying to take the path seriously to like be playing a bunch of online video games, like shooting a bunch of people probably in a Muslim country and like, being like oh, I did it. Like that's, that's very odd that those types of games even exist. But if someone is doing that and playing some video game or something, we should be mind the, who we're in the, the virtually being affected by because French do form based on someone playing you know online video games or whatever or any i can't think of like other good virtual examples but any virtual example where you are spending time with people their state will affect you right um it, if, if it's intentional and there's like a social element to it so it should just be we should be careful about it and then um the last thing virtually is who are we influenced by so um there's like a lot of um uh, people who we might follow on the internet, celebrities or people who are like influencers that are on their way to be celebrities or something like that. Um, and if we're really into someone and we're into their life, and if we know like one or two details about their life that we have no business knowing, we have to be careful of how much they're influencing us if they are not people of goodness. If there's like people who are benefiting us, alhamdulillah. But if they're just talking about something that's inconsequential, we're really, we're just like, oh, I wonder what they're doing right now. And like, people have started to follow these, they started to form these kind of, um, like, uh, it's, it's, they're, they're like a, you could say it's a community, but it's really a bunch of people who are really into that person. I don't know how to describe it's not a cult, but they're, it's, 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 it's almost like that, where there's like a certain types of celebrities where everybody wants to know what's going on. And they're just like super into it, like the royal family. I just don't understand. What is it about the colonizing royal family that created problems for hundreds of years in the whole world and why everyone is into the royal family and talking about the royal family? And so you don't want the state of the heart of the royal family to affect you. That's not, you really don't. And to watch, oh, what's Harry and May? What are Harry and Meghan doing? And what are this person doing? Oh my goodness. And then the queen died and da, 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 da. And it's like, they, they, for the Muslim especially, Especially if you have uh, have any family who ever was in the Muslim world, they just did. I mean, it was it was it was murdering, raping, pillaging was what they, what what their reigns did, right? And now they're the descendants of those reigns, but it's insignificant for us. But to be gravitated towards that, that's a sign of like I gotta detach, because you don't want to be attached to these types of people. We really don't, and we have to be careful that the, the latest thing that comes out, and we just like gravitate towards it. We gravitate towards it. We gravitate towards it. The Muslim is 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 not one who follows the latest trend when it comes out if it's not in line with with our principles, um, and and so really it comes down to anything that stirs up desire in the heart. The highest level of desire is haram desire, right? So anything that's a sexual desire or a desire to do something haram, to smoke, to drink, to 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 enter into an impermissible environment, to start doing something, and and to look at the the impermissible. But then it's also a desire where it's not haram, but it's not going to benefit you. So a desire for the dunya, desire for prominence, desire for fame and so on, desire to just like be into vain conversation um, and, and so on. So that is the, the, next, uh, the next, that's really the next category. And really, again, we just have to know what our, um, our, our state is and what level we can apply this to. Just wanna reiterate that everybody should not apply this equally. Everybody apply this kind of custom based on your own um, mindset. Um, otherwise it will create problems and be very, very gentle in terms of applying this with family. Um, if your mom starts talking about like the queen of England or the king of England, do not just smile and say something great. Right? Like do not start to get into like, oh my God, but who cares about the king of England? They're just a bunch of killers and Muslims. Like that's not, that's probably not the right idea. Have you know, adab and respect for your mom, unless you're like really close friends and you can kind of mention that. Um, 
And the, the final two principles we'll mention here, and then we'll end here, inshallah, open up questions, is really having a balance with socializing in general. So Imam Ghazali, his whole point here is that these hadith are indicating that as times get worse, worse, and worse, the prominence of, of individual time and what's called um, in Ramadan, it's itikaf, which is isolating for worship, but what's called uzla or seclusion or um, that khalwa, spiritual seclusion, becomes more and more significant, becomes more and more important. And so in our time, we need socialization. We need time to hang out with people. We need time to hang out with that, that good fellow fellow Muslims and others. But we should have a portion of our time where we get used to alone time. And if we're really extroverted, we have to find a portion of our time where we tune into a level of alone time. And if we're introverted, we might already be doing this. And, you know, ideally, spiritually, that's, that's probably a good thing, right? Um, that we're probably already... We might need to make sure we spend a little bit more time with with, with others in order to to, to um, if, especially if there are people who could be beneficial to us. But the alone time is really really important. And for the one who, as the more and more someone travels the path, the more and more the desire kicks in to just sometimes want to be alone, just be alone with Allah. You're sitting in a room, you're just thinking of Allah, you're just doing thicker, you're re rereading something beneficial. You just you it, it doesn't feel like a burden it's not like oh i gotta go pray and this is like no and so for the for the you might have alone time during prayer this is probably more common sometimes for women for men ideally men are praying in congregation um but but if not then uh the alone time might be during the prayer but ideally there's alone time where it's just every day or every i remember one of my teachers mentioned that every day or once a week try to have just just some one-on-one -on -one quiet time with Allah. Ideally in like when it's dark outside. So ideally in the nighttime, like post Maghrib, post Isha or before Fajr. And just where it's you sitting with Allah and now it's your time with him. And this is what's going to create what's called um, an intimacy with Allah in your relationship with Allah, where someone is going to really start to get into a, a desire where they just want to speak to him in the heart and they just want to talk to him and converse with him. Allah says, remember me and I will remember you. And so their companion, they're like, who are you with? Who are you hanging out with? And you're just like, well, Allah says, if I remember him, he's remembering me. So really that person is now in the highest gathering. They're in the gathering of uh, with Allah and the angels. Well, uh, they get to a state where they actually experience that in their, uh, in their states, but that's a very, that's a different topic. Um, and and at the same time, the balance here should be that whoever the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to spend time with, we should spend time with while making righteous intentions. So we might know the hadith where it was asked, O oh, Messenger of Allah, who is most deserving of my company? And he says, your mother. And he says, that after that, who is most deserving of my company? He says, your mother. He says, after that, who is most deserving of my company? He says, your mother. He says, after that, who is most deserving of my company? He says, your father. Right. And so we know that even spending time with parents in general is very virtuous. But that's that, that if done with good intentions, especially, um, even if sometimes there's there's disagreements and things that that um, may, may happen because that happens in families, that's like a very 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 good thing, very good thing spiritually to do, right? To spend time with parents and spend time with family and siblings with the right with the right intentions. And ideally, if someone is doing something in, in, impermissible or, 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 or questionable or haram, with family, there's enough of a connection where someone can gently guide them away from that. That's probably not the best thing to do, right? But it's important, obviously, to spend time here. But everybody else, when it comes to, to the vast majority of other people, we have to be calculated and careful and apply this. And then when we are searching for friends, we've been given traits for who to look for or for, for what to look for. So ideally, there's, there's four or five traits here. First is people who they have value for the theme inwardly and outwardly. In some portion of their life, it's valuable. And that's shown as well. It's important to have people, especially in America in the time we live in, who outwardly, they care about Islam. What do I mean inwardly, outwardly? There's inwardly, you might be like, well, my relationship between me and Allah is between me and Allah, and it's private. And so like that person may never want to talk about religion. They may never want to pray with other people. They're just like, it's just, I have my own relationship. And that's up to them, but that's not the way of our deen. The way of our deen is that someone is outwardly and inwardly present and practicing, right? And so um, we have to make sure that there is ideally some level of value. And if it's not there, if it's not there, then um, we decide how much time we're going to spend. Okay, maybe instead of every week, we reduce it to once a month. And we try to, for those other two or three weeks, we try to find people who are going to benefit our spiritual state. We're going to benefit our spiritual state. 
The one exception here is arrogant religious people. This is actually called out in uh, many of the books of the scholars that hanging out with ar arrogant religious people would do more harm for you than hanging out with most non-Muslims. And the reason for that is because the, he says in the Hikam that um, it's better to be with an ignorant person who is aware of their faults, who is aware that they have a lot of work to do, than an arrogant person who is full of themselves, the scholar who is arrogant and full of themselves, who thinks that they have nothing to work on. That's a very dangerous person to be around. And um, hopefully that's not really the case for the vast majority of, of, of people, but sometimes that can happen where we might hang out at the religious gathering and all everybody wants to do is look down at everybody else and finger point and talk about them. It's that they do this and this group is wrong, and they're wrong, and they're going to hell and that person's probably gonna have that room in hell and they're just constantly finger pointing at everybody else and just no concern for themselves. It's just this arrogant looking down. That is a very dangerous person to hang around. Very, very dangerous. And we should just, just not think of that as like, we're hanging out with a person of religion. We should think of that as we're hanging out with a person of arrogance. And Allah hates arrogance. Only Allah is allowed to be proud. That's it. No one else is allowed to be proud. Everybody else uh, has, must be humble. We have nothing to be proud of at the end of the day. We have to be humble before Allah. So that's that's a very damn. Otherwise, people who value the deen and really, and of course, everyone has flaws. Might be time where someone's ego or nafs comes out. I'm talking about if the dominant state is one of arrogance, we should be careful. Second trait is people who take the prayer seriously. And um, this will usually be shown, uh, it will be clear to somebody, but um, you don't want to hang out in a gathering where you have made awkward, you, that it's awkward to pray. And I know sometimes of, um, um, in Muslim gatherings where Muslims will be like, it's Maghrib time. I mean, like for Dohar Asr, you could kind of assume people are going to pray. But it's like Maghrib time, you got a little bit of time to pray Maghrib, 20, 30-ish minutes, right? The, that that um, you, you, you usually are not supposed to push it out all the way until Isha. Um, and no one is praying. No one is getting up. It's like everyone's at a dinner and they're just like, everyone's just eating dinner. And you're like, all right, so maybe they're taking the whole like eat the food while it's warm and don't pray thing. But then it gets later and later and you're like, all right, so they're done eating. No one's praying. And now you feel awkward because you're the only, you're like, but we're all Muslim, right? Sometimes it's easier than non-Muslim. You're like, I gotta go pray real quick. But the Muslims, you're like, guys, what's everybody doing? Like it's, it's, and so you, you, it's very important because someone their confidence may not be at the point where they're comfortable enough getting up, just being like, I got to go do this. They might not be there yet. So hanging out with people who will have that impact will, will, will negatively impact someone's spiritual state. And you never want to answer to Allah that, why did I miss my prayers? Because everybody else was doing it. Like, that's like a very, that's not a good answer. It's, it's, a very, it's like, why did I jump off a cliff? Everyone else is doing it. It's not a, not a good answer, right? We want to that, be careful here. Um, and the third is that someone who is going to actually help us know our weak points and our blind spots and help us become better people. These are the best people to be with. That sincere friends actually care about us such to the point where they're, act they're gonna tell us like, hey, you're doing this thing, it's probably not the best thing for you to be doing and I would recommend you try this, this, and this. And they're gonna try to sincerely guide us. That deen is sincere advice as it comes in one hadith. So we should try then to be with people who are um, not fault finding, that's not a good trait, but they help us bring out the best in ourselves and the parts in us that aren't so good, they help us work on those parts. And um, usually there's nothing better than this than people who are like the, the uh, um, like elder, elder brothers or sisters in the spiritual path, like people who have maybe been doing this for 10, 20 more years, or maybe a person who's in a position of, of, of who's older and in a position of knowledge, that they'll very, very gently just point you to, to something. Like, for example, if someone is dressed in probably not the most modest way, men or women, rather than, like, just call it out, they'll just say something that just doesn't really look that comfortable and just very gently just be like, oh, probably not the most comfortable thing. Have you tried this instead? And it'll all be about comfort rather than making someone feel bad about the way that they're dressing because the clothes that they're wearing are too tight, right? And they'll just very subtly do it, and then you'll be like, yeah, actually way more comfortable to be in this. Why am I wearing this all the time? And then someone will change. And all um, uh, that all of their their efforts um, will be very, very gentle in terms of the way that they approach usually. And sometimes they have to have conversations. So um, that is the traits to look for in, in terms of people. And then um, really lastly, that spending time in gatherings of goodness. There are gatherings of, of haram, there's neutral gatherings, and then there's gatherings of goodness. The, um, the scholars advise that if we're trying to travel the path, every 
week or every two-ish weeks, um, but ideally every week, we have one of these gatherings in our life. One is a gathering of knowledge. Um, so, so, so some type of gathering of, of knowledge per week. Um, and this could be uh, virtual or in person, but in person is always better. The second is a gathering of dhikr. Dhikr and knowledge are different. Knowledge is a form of dhikr and it precedes dhikr in a lot of ways, but a gathering of dhikr is one in which people are getting together, reciting Quran, doing some form of salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu saying la ilaha illallah, um, be this out loud or silently, they're doing a dua, and then you know they're eating and they're hanging out afterwards, but there's some dhikr because that will impact the heart in a very, very positive spiritual way. And we should become people who if we're ever in a gathering, we sprinkle it with dhikr or a dua. And this is something that may Allah bless um, him. My, I've seen my father-in-law, mashallah, always do this. And it's um, that it'll be like a family gathering, just like a lunch, a family lunch or something like that. Everyone will have lunch. It'll be great. And then at the end, just for two, three minutes, he gathers everybody together and just like, we're going to do a family dua. And um, based on a narration that if someone does not remember Allah in a gathering, um, then they are like... Uh, I believe it's like some type of animal was mentioned. It's just like a bunch of animals gathering together because the remembrance of Allah is what differentiates the human being. Um, in this case, the, the conscious remembrance of Allah. Um, and so that he'll just make da and it will leave everybody, everyone will kind of leave on a good note. And you know, subhanAllah, there's a lot of people who they're looking for some type of spiritual connection, but they might not even really know how to make the dua or they might not know the types of duas to make. And so they actually really benefit from that. So if we could be that person where everyone is hanging out or like a dinner or something like that or having coffee and then you're like, hey, before we leave, like I just want to share something beneficial. You mentioned some something you learned, some some spirit of spiritual benefit. Or you you collectively make dua. Or or you have a group of friends, you you change, okay, this person's gonna make dua this week, next person's gonna make dua the next week. And it kind of gets people to learn how to make dua and 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 make dua uh, ideally, you know, publicly with, with a few people. And so that will have immense benefit. Something small. We'll have, we'll do, you'll, someone will be doing da'wah and it will be a means of um, that removing any haram that, would, that might have come through the gathering. So ultimately here, it's about balance and we just need to be balanced in terms of the ways in which we engage with other people, in which the ways we engage with um, friends, the types of friends that we make, the type of company that we keep. And always keep in mind that there are people who are going to be means of bringing other people down. That's a reality. And sometimes it's hard to accept that. But Allah makes it super clear in the Quran. There's like a few different surahs where he mentions people talking to each other in either heaven and he um, between heaven and hell, in hell together, or in heaven together. And you have people that are talking in hell together, blaming that you brought me here. You did the friends. They, they used to be literally like the word that's used is like best friends, like homies in the last life. And then they'll be saying, you did this and you brought me here. And now I'm, I've ruined everything because of you. Then there'll be a person between heaven and hell who the person in heaven will say to the person in hell that you almost did that, but alhamdulillah Allah guided me and I didn't let your, your call to do something haram bring me into that. And I, and I, and I was saved. And I was saved. And, um, uh, and there's people in heaven who are talking to each other just alhamdulillah that we, Allah gave us a blessing to spend a good life in that life. And we spend a good life in this life. That Allah give us goodness in the dunya. That in the, and in the akhirah give us goodness and protect us from the fire. There are people who actualize that dua and they are the happiest people. That in this life they enjoy goodness to each other and to their families and their communities. And in the next life together as great friends and, and people who really love each other for the sake of Allah. That's what loving each other for the sake of Allah means that they enjoy the blessings of, 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 of paradise and of nearness to Allah together. So we ask that Allah make us people who guide others to good and make us people who that have a good a develop an understanding of what to look for in companionship and what to look for in friendship. And then Allah bring good people into our lives, into our lives and allow us um, to also be means of, of good for them, inshallah. And uh, that if we are in situations where we're hanging out with people who are Maybe not the best influences that Allah find. Give us gentle ways to remove ourselves from those situations. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa sallam Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. So, any questions either uh, in person or online? Yes, actually. So, can I ask you some stories of people to avoid the Islamic 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 Islamic
Yeah, really good question. The question is if, with regards to the categories of um, uh, people to avoid, especially if they're a good friend, is withdrawing always the best answer? And the answer is no, withdrawing is not the best answer. Right? So you have to be wise about knowing what will be um, right to do. So in our religion, we are taught to apply knowledge with hikmah, with wisdom, with 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 um, uh, with, with, yeah, with wisdom be the right word here. And uh, so you have to know. You never just leave someone cold turkey, especially a Muslim. You never just leave them hanging. That's not that's not the way. But let's say that someone is really bringing you down, like just all sorts of things that they're doing are impermissible and they're bringing you down. You limit the times when they're bringing you down those interactions. And you find permissible times to hang out with them. So like instead of, let's say, some two people used to always hang out. And before someone started taking the religion seriously, they used to drink together or used to smoke together. Um, and now one person has started to practice the religion and they stopped drinking and stopped smoking. And the other person is still doing it. When they're smoking and drinking, it's not a good time to hang out with them. But if you could like go for get some coffee and go for a walk and just catch up on life, and be a means of bringing good into that other person's life, that's very, very good. So it's really just you have to, you and I have to know um, how to apply this such that there will be more benefit done to someone else than harm done to us. And we have to be ready for the harm that's done to us and be able to do the work before and after to kind of heal that, that harm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Other questions? Um, Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. It's a really good question. The question was about approval of other people and seeking it. And um, uh, is it not a good thing if someone like says good job or incur uh, words of encouragement and you feel positive? So. It's um, usually not at that level where you, the human being needs encouragement. So you need people who you look up to or you have good relationships with to encourage you, right? So like at the basic level, every human being has a need for their parents to tell for their parents to tell them that they're proud of them or that like good job, right? And if they didn't get that enough, they they long for that. They want that, right? Then you'll have other people in your family and your close circles, and then at work you need that encouragement. Otherwise, you don't know if you're doing a good job or not. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about here is you're like seeking. You're, you're putting on a whole like, conversation and you're posturing to get the approval of other people. It's really like um, um, it could be on social media where someone is like just showing off just so everyone could just praise them. I mean, that's that's not advisable, right? Same thing if in person, right? Someone is like... Um, Showing, like, brings their very, very specific outfit and their very specific car, just hoping that everyone is just going to praise them and compliment them and give them nazar along the way, unfortunately. But um, they're, they're just hoping for that. That's not advisable. But good general human encouragement, that's totally fine. There's a very high level that, that Imam Ghazali does get into where you just see all praise is coming from Allah. If someone praises you, or you're like, this is really just Allah enabling them to praise is me Allah, like, alhamdulillah. But you see this coming and you're like, Allah gave me this quality. It's not really anything I did anyways. Because Allah gave me this ability to do good work. So alhamdulillah. That's why the believer, when we get praised, we say alhamdulillah. All praise belongs to Allah. Because it does belong to him. Because he gave us the ability to do the good thing that got the praise. And he gave the person the ability to praise us. So it actually belongs to him at the end. Um, so you can do that. But it's kind of like the forceful um, ego desiring it. If that Does that make sense? Um, online, someone says, how do I tell my friend to pray? I am not sure how to do that. Yeah, so um, the first thing is if someone is struggling to tell like their friends to pray is you model the prayer for them, right? So you you um, pray in front of them. When the prayer time comes, you're like, hey, I got to go pray, even if they're not doing it. That's the first. The second is that if we want to tell others to pray, we talk about the benefits of prayer and the benefit it's having in our life in front of them. So if someone starts praying and now your life starts to change and you start to feel better and you start to feel that things are improving and you start to feel a deeper relationship with Allah, you you tell them about that, right? And you, you encourage them through gentle stories. Like, you know, I was really struggling with this one thing and then I prayed and that day I prayed Fajr. Alhamdulillah, I felt so much better. And you, you tell them about the effects. 
And then third is if in every now and then you can sprinkle in little pieces of, of like, hey, like I've noticed you haven't, you know, you haven't really been praying. I just want to see like everything okay. Um, I know you used to do this or uh, that maybe you've been struggling with it. I just thought to check in. It shouldn't be done from a place of like, don't you know it's halal, it's haram not to pray. Like every, people know that. It should be from a place of, hey, I'm concerned about you and I want to make sure that you're okay. Um, and that those would be a couple of, of ideas. Okay, if there's any other questions online, just post them. Anything else? Sister side, any questions? Anything? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No. Last time you said you don't know it's like required for you as a man to work. Um, what about like retirement or like or the yeah, yeah, okay, so good question. The question is, if, if we mentioned last time that um, with regards to the topic on dunya, that for a man, it's farther to work. And what about if someone like retires or has no need to? It's required to provide is what I should have meant. Yeah, yeah it was what I meant to say. So the, the you have to provide for your family. If someone like has a very nice, uh, you know, they're at an IPO or a tech company and there's a nice IPO and now they're just set, you don't have to work. You can just chill if you want. Go worship, go to Umrah, go do this, go do, go do some, go do good in the community as long as you're providing the man cannot give up the obligation of providing and just be like yo i'm just gonna sit and watch netflix and expect you know all the the that you know their their wife to just like make all the money that 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 would be considered not from that would be haram and that would not be the right thing to do um but the, the providing is what's important yeah so if someone is set and, and retirement you're usually like um at that point in someone's life if they're blessed with children, let's say they don't have a 401k, and their children begin to take care of them. And that, like, their their responsibility stops at that point. And now it's the son's responsibility to take care of both uh, of, of, of his parents or, or the sons to split that up um, financially. That is their responsibility in our in our in our nation. Yes. And following on that, is it, uh, it's not like religiously as an obligation of uh, kids to support the parents after the cats or the fellow right? Like, it's a religious requirement. The question is, is it religious responsibility? Um, yeah, it is a religious requirement for us to take care of our parents um, if they cannot take care of themselves. And this would be at the level of like, if it's imposing undue hardship on someone, meaning like they just have no ability to take care of anybody like themselves, their family and their parents. Okay, that circumstance changes. And now everyone is in a state of poverty together. right? And there, that happens. Sometimes everyone is just struggling. But Whatever means someone has, and they're able to make their ends meet, their parents have no means. Now, this is this is incumbent on this on the man for sure. Um, and 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 if if there's if for a daughter as well, honestly, if she's able to, and she doesn't, that's that's that would be very very problematic in the sight of God, right? But if she's unable to, like let's say she has no, no money of her own, um, most of the time many women these are working, but if she has no money of her own and whatnot, then her husband would not be required to support her parents. But for your direct parents, yes, it is required. And we don't believe in nursing homes. We don't believe in sending parents off to just go live somewhere and just like send, to, no, it's like find a way to take care of them to, to the level that's that's possible for us, if that makes sense. Um, there's a question here. Is it okay to have non-Muslim friends so, that, so, as they, so long as they do not encourage an un-Islamic behavior, as they don't encourage un-Islamic behavior? So when it comes, this again depends on your level of practice. You might be totally fine hanging out with non-Muslims, and if they're not openly imposing worldviews on you that are problematic or um, questioning your values, then you would be fine, right? And, and, and up, if you are at a point where you don't want to um, be very, very careful with who you are with, at that situation, what you should avoid is being best friends with the non muslim that is advised against, I believe, specifically in the Quran, that to become really like, like just close, like you're just like this. They know your secrets. They know depths of your soul. And there's you, you're like you're not doing dawah. There's no chance that they're converting, right? It's just they got their thing, you know, and you got your religion. That's not advised to become really close friends, but to have acquaintances and friends, yeah, that's gonna happen. It's totally, you know, wouldn't be wouldn't be wouldn't be bad necessarily. But if someone is more diligent about the spiritual path and really care that when they're hanging out with people, they're usually talking about Allah. Because at some point, if you're thinking a lot about Allah, you'll just talk 
talk a lot about Allah. It's just going to happen because you're just thinking about God all the time. So at some point, just going to that's like what whatever's in here is what's going to come out. And now you're trying to talk about God, and they don't even believe in God. That's going to be just going to get a little bit tricky, right? And um, they'll just they'll be fine, but at some point they'll be like, "Why are you a missionary? Like, why are you you know what are you trying to what are you trying to do, right?" And they won't understand. You know, so it just really depends on your. Um, Hijabi influence culture, influence your culture. Yeah, I'm, I don't really have any thoughts on this. Not my, uh, yeah. I mean, if someone is doing good in the world, alhamdulillah, good for them. And if they're not doing good, then probably we should report it. Um, and are there exceptions for certain shift based workers like healthcare workers? Okay, I, I think I missed that question when it came in. It must have been pertaining to a topic. So if you're still here, if you could clarify what that question means. Um, I, do, I don't know the context of that question. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Uh, so this is obvious that um, when we spend time with people, we get affected. Sometimes at work, uh, there might be lost in politics. Uh, Sometimes you can get carried away and you can get stuck in that uh, environment. How do you make sure that you are more mindful? don't become part of that system. And the other thing is that when someone is trying to become a better Muslim, they are doing more right his act. Uh, more than that thing, how do you make sure that you don't fall into Muslim patient? Great question. Okay, so the first one was that we might be at work, um, there is a lot of gossiping that's going on. How do we avoid getting getting caught up? We might get caught up into it, so how do we avoid it? Yeah, so the first thing, when it comes to backbiting and gossiping, knowing the seriousness of the sin. So if someone were to like offer you pork, just be like, hey, come eat some bacon. We would we probably wouldn't do it, right? Like most of us, hopefully none of us would eat the bacon. Muslims are super serious about their pork. They're like, I'll do all the other sins, but I'll never eat pork. Um, so, so if someone were to just offer you that, we wouldn't do it. So the seriousness of the sin is first you start reflecting on that. And you think about the fact that like, I'm gonna eat the dead flesh of the person who I'm talking bad about. And I don't even like them. Like, they're my manager. I don't want to eat my manager's. Like, it's just gross. Right? You're just like, I don't, you don't like the person in the first place. And then the punishment is severe. And then you don't like them also. And you're going to give them your good deeds and take their bad deeds. Right? That's the, the other punishment for, for, for backbiting is you give someone. This includes non-Muslims. We're going to give them our good deeds. And if we run out, we have to take their bad deeds. And we're, it's not even like we're doing that to someone we like, you know. And so this is reflecting on the, on the seriousness. And you have we have to spend time. Ideally, if we know we're going to enter into a workplace or we have friends or co-workers at work who do this, before we even go there, it's good to have a little spiritual re reboost about these topics. So there might be certain things that we are struggling with every day, but we read a hadith or a verse about that every day because we know we're going to struggle with that that day. So we like we remind ourselves of this. We might make it the, um, what's it called, the wallpaper on our phone. So you see every morning, you're like on the way to work and you see this wallpaper and you're like, oh, I should probably be careful. And it would be a good reminder. You remind yourself, I probably shouldn't do this because otherwise with the human being, we forget. So it's the first thing is the knowledge. The second thing is that um, we have to avoid the topics when they come up. And as soon as they come up, we find reasons to exit. We go, ah, like I got to go get this deliverable done or I have to go. You might even say, I got to go to the restroom. I got to go get some food. I, you just, you find a way to leave the room or leave the virtual room. Right. It's usually at like the beginning of meetings or at the end of meetings, usually like the substantive part of the meeting. No one is going to talk about other people. Um, it's usually like kind of when there's chit chat time and you just find uh, you, you find a way to avoid that. Right. Um, and if you can't do it, if you and I cannot avoid it, we at least have to hate it in our heart. But we can't contribute to it. So we just stay quiet. And that might be a great time to be the person who's just on their phone. You know, you're in the room, everyone's talking about someone else, you're waiting for the meeting to start, and you're just like, you know, whatever, uh, reading the news or checking your, your email or something like that, or on Slack, like you're doing something else, right? But you're not engaging in the, the topic. If someone starts engaging in the topic, then you have to make sure afterwards you do istighfar, and you seek Allah's assistance and forgiveness for engaging in that. Because it, it, is, it, is, it is serious, and it, we will get caught up in it. But the more you and I remind ourselves and, and the more fervently someone repents, eventually Allah opens the door for them to not do that sin again. It's usually how it works. So you seriously repent. You're like, I feel so bad. Please give me the strength to avoid this sin. 
go stop at some point. Um, uh, I think that was it for the first question. Um, oh yeah, and la no, lastly, for the first one. Uh, until the Muslims began to model good character, who is going to model it at, at the end of the day for everybody else, right? The Prophet Sallam was sent, he says, I was only sent to perfect noble character. That's one of his main missions is to perfect noble character. The vast majority of the people in the world, like if you ever use the word backbiting, they don't even know what that is. It's not even, a, they know what gossip is, but they don't even know what that is. What do you mean backbiting? What does that mean? Oh, to talk bad about someone else. They're like, oh, there's a term for that? Uh, I didn't even know that because no one guided them. It's not even their fault. There's been no moral guidance. They don't teach it in schools. There's no courses on ethics. Like very few people have ethics or frameworks to, to, to live their life by. We are blessed, alhamdulillah, as Muslims, we have, we have those frameworks. Even Christians or Jews or people of, of other faiths, they might not practice enough to know what their texts say, right? Um, so sometimes someone has to model that. So if you actually, someone starts talking negative about someone and you and I are like, hey, we, I, I, it's probably better if we don't say that about them. It's, probably, it's not really the nicest thing. And you actually stand up for them. You'll get respect in that person's eyes. Why? Because they know when the other person starts talking bad about them, you're going to stand up for them too. It's your person of, of values. And that's the place the ummah needs, that we need to get to as a community is we need to start being comfortable with our values. This is our values. They don't hide any of their values. They, they're saying change your pronoun to six different pronouns now. There's all their values that have been corrupted are out there. Everybody has to comply with them. We're hiding behind something for our values, you know. So we just have to kind of be, be mindful of that. The second question was about Ria. And what was the question? It was about if we start to experience Riyadh? Yeah, I think if someone is uh, inclined to be short by his act and out of nowhere they are getting inside their soul that they, they are becoming better person than other people. Uh, got it, got it, yeah. They are doing that to his uh, Yeah, yeah, okay. Power. The question is about Riyadh, it's about ostentation. And um, it's about whether when you and I are engaged in worship, and then we begin, we do something, we're engaged in worship, and then we start to feel better than other people. And we start to feel that we, we yeah. What is Riyadh? So Riyadh is, um, you do something so that someone can know, a religious act of worship, so someone can notice that you did it and that they praise you for it. So this is usually done with like extra acts of worship. So if you are, I mentioned earlier, like if you're fasting, like it's like a, sun, it's a sunnah day to fast and you you're just like, oh, it's Thursday, Thursday's Wednesday, tomorrow's Thursday. You're like, Thursday, fasting. And you want someone to know that you're fasting. What that does is it corrupts the deed because you're doing it for the sake of Allah. You're not doing it. And so you, when you tell someone about it, like, oh, yeah, like I did a Sunday fast today. Like someone usually won't do it like that. But they'll find ways to subtly mention it. What they do is they negate the reward of that because they didn't do it for the sake of Allah. They did it for the sake of praise of someone else. That's Riyadh, ostentation, religious showing off is basically what it is. So the question was like, when you start, if you're doing ibadah, everybody will go through this spiritually at some point. When someone starts to take the path more seriously, this is why he's going to cover it. as a whole section on it, alhamdulillah, inshallah, that, that we will encounter first is riyah, ostentation. The second is ujub. There's actually three. There's kibber, which is arrogance. There's riyah, which is showing off. And there's ujub, which doesn't require anybody. You're just being impressed with yourself. You're just looking in the mirror and you're like, yeah, like you're just really impressed with yourself. That's that, that spiritually, I mean. Um, that, that those are the subtle ones. So Riyadh, the way, the cure for this is sincerity and ikhlas. And you and I have to turn back to Allah every time we feel Riyadh. So we say, Ya Allah, I'm sorry. I know you're watching me. I don't know why I'm concerned about what other people think. I can't help it. It's something in me that's weak. I'm, I'm, I ask your, you, you turn to Allah, ask him for forgiveness, and you ask him to correct your intention. Oh, the main thing we need to do for Riyadh, the quick answer, and we'll get into the detailed answer later, inshallah, but the quick answer is you and I correct the intention. The more sincerity that someone has, the less Riyadh that they'll have. Until they get to a point where they're fully aware of the fact that Allah is watching them and Allah is the one who you do everything for. And so people will become less and less of a reason why they do things. Until at some point, they're just like, it, it doesn't concern them. But everyone is at risk for it. The Prophet ﷺ, he said that Riyadh, is more subtle than a black ant crawling on a black rock in the depths of the night. That's how subtle it is. It's super, super subtle. So it's okay that you and I feel that. Like, it's subtle. It's going to happen. I mean, it, it's 
if you ever if you ever had ants and you have like I have a, like a black desk at home and so the ants if there's ever ants on the black desk I can't even notice them until they start crawling on me and then I'm like oh there's ants now I have to you know, handle it so now imagine he said ants crawling on a black rock in the darkness of the night who's going to be able to see that right the people of spiritual light will be able to see it so the more you strengthen your nur the more you ask Allah for nur and sincerity the easier it will become eventually to tackle it but there is like a whole section on it and if it still doesn't cover it Imam Ghazali has a whole book on Riyadh a whole book, like 200 pages, just on Riyadh and how to cure it. Because it's a big disease that happens. Yeah. Does that make sense? Okay, let me just see if there's online, if there's anyone. Um, can Witter be one rakat? Uh, if you are, so the Hanafis will pray three rakat. If you're Shafi, or um, I think the Malikis, you'll pray two and then one. So do two rakat and then the Shafa and Witter, and they'll do one. So yeah, it, it could be, but you always have the two before the one. They'll separate it though. Um, okay. And how can we ask Allah for forgiveness for gossiping? So the way to ask forgiveness for backbiting is similar to asking forgiveness for any other sin. Um, where first and foremost, you and I feel remorse for doing it. Number two, we actively engage in the process of asking Allah to forgive us and to pardon us for uh, engaging in the backbiting. And number three, we make the intention to never do that thing again. The fourth part that is included in backbiting is ideally if we can repair the damage we did to someone else, we do so. But in our time, it's not a time where you go and tell someone, like, hey, I was talking smack about you, I'm sorry. Like, that won't go over well. So you have to re repay that by, you have to make du'a for them. To the extent that we backbited them, now we have to make du'a for them. And if it got really serious, we're, we, the scholars advise we donate some charity in their name. And we, we, we try to do some good deed in their name. So you go and you, make a, you feed some, uh, someone who's less privileged, or you donate charity like on Islamic Relief or something, and you do it in the name of that person who you who we spend a lot of time backbiting and talking bad about and gossiping. Um, okay, I think that's yeah. uh, yes. Is what? Uh, uh, is ajr the same thing as hasanat or ujub? So ajr, ajr is like a reward for a deed. Yeah. And then hasanat is also another kind of word for reward or goodness that you get for a deed. But I'm, but that's ajr, not ujub. Ujub is a spiritual deed. Ujub is, um, in, in um, English, this would be like, like U-J-U-B. Ujub is uh, translated as uh, oh, it's conceit, conceit, conceitedness, basically. There's a better translation, but that... Um, uh, not remembering it right now, but conceding that. Yeah. Is complaining about someone the same thing as backbiting? Um, Ninety percent of the time, it might be. There's a few times where it's not. So if you have to validly complain, let's say you go to a person of authority who can, um, like example, if someone is like at school or at work, and someone has done something like wrong, like a They've said something inappropriate. There's been some type of harassment, racist comments, inappropriate jokes, whatever it is. At that point, you're, you, you should go to a person of authority and tell them, like, hey, this is what they were doing, and it's not right, right? And you, you're not really complaining about them, but you're, you're, you are in one sense, right? That's one thing. If, you, if there is a way to talk about someone where you can get something resolved, that would be fine, even if it's mentioning negative traits about someone. The complaining that's about backbiting is like... Um, you just like hate your coworker and you just come home every day and you're just like, oh my God, and today she did this and he did this. And it's just like so annoying and just like he takes credit for my work and like, and or like a friend at work or not even a friend, a, a person at school. And you're complaining about them by people we call it venting these days. That's not really something that exists in our spiritual tradition um, uh, unless there's no point for, there's no constructive solving of problems there. Or again, therapist, or you really need sincere advice. So you go to a friend, you need to tell, get something off your chest, but you're hoping to get advice. Alhamdulillah, that's fine. But if there's no advice and you're just like going on and on and on, that now you're mentioning negative traits about them and you're complaining. Um, and so it's kind of like you're doing both at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, question. Um, it's like a hypothetical scenario. Um, let's say that uh, you, you have a friend who meets somebody new. And you know that this person might not like you, or even when they're sorry, um, might have like some significant negative qualities. Um, is it okay for you to like warn your 
your friend or to discuss those things with them, or does that also fall under that? Yeah, so the question is, um, just to repeat it, that if you have a friend, they're about to hang out with someone or get to know someone or bring someone into their life who is very much going to be a negative influence, can you warn them? Um, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you, not only can you, you are required to in that instance. So you, you must. Um, it's an obligation. If you know something bad that someone is about to get into, it doesn't qualify as backbiting. So there are circumstances in which backbiting doesn't apply. That would be once you just mentioned. Another circumstance would be marriage. If you know someone is considering a proposal or a uh, potential person to get married to, and there's known problems about that person, like whatever the problems are, um, as long as they're not like something that is insignificant or like cosmetic or something superficial, it's like real serious, but you have to, you must tell the person. You now find out that they are about to potentially consider them, you gotta go and find a way to tell them nicely and don't mention anything extra. So in this instance, you would warn them, you'd be like, hey, person not really the best influence. They, I know that they do X, Y, Z, and I think you should avoid it. If you can get through to them without mentioning the sin, it's even better. If you're like, look, it's not a good person. I've been around them. I would avoid it. And they're like, they won't listen. They're like, no, it's not a big deal. And then you have to say it. You say it, but you stop it there. You don't be. You don't in, include like you know some extra trait about them that you don't like. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there, there are circumstances in our religion where it's not black and white. Backbiting is permitted in certain circumstances. Also, lying is permitted in certain circumstances. That people think lying, lying for ninety nine point nine percent of circumstances is never allowed. But there are circumstances in which lying. Like for example, if if the police are unjustly trying to get somebody who didn't even do anything wrong and they come to your house and they're like hiding in a closet and the police knock on your house and be like, yo, is so-and-so here? And you'd be like, yeah, he's in the closet. And not a good idea, you don't, you know, because because you the police are the unjust ones in the in this circumstance of, of the example, if that makes sense. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's a good question. So the question is for those online that um, how do we manage the balance between not bottling everything up inside um, and at the same time, we don't want to get into backbiting. And so we still want to be able to have like discussions or like let out some of the, the you could say, the steam that we have and, and still not get into, into, into doing something that's impermissible. And what's the balance there? Um, so I'm going to talk about this at a few different at the higher stages. The adab is that you first go to Allah with everything. That's the adab with Allah. For the spiritual traveler, the adab is that Allah is your source, khalas. And you go to him, and until you've talked to Allah, and you've cried to Allah, and you've made dua to Allah, it would be breaching that adab if you now start to talk to human beings about that. With Allah, there is no backbiting and there's no complaining. It doesn't, like, it's you complain to Allah openly, right? Not in like, oh, Allah, you did this to me, you did this to me, but like, well, Allah, this person is really like I'm really struggling with this person, and then um, this is happening to me. And like, please help me. Like, I really need your help. Like, please. I, and you 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 use that as a means of getting from the depths of your heart to um, beg beg for Allah's assistance. Usually, most of the tests in our life are coming to bring us to that state, and most of the the difficulties we go through that come through people are help us get to a state where we sincerely in a complete. State state of devotion and turning to Allah and Allah's oneness, we ask him for help. And so that's what the first thing that ideally is supposed to be done. And um, then there's kind of a spectrum here where someone might do a portion of that and then might need to get constructive advice. There's nothing wrong with constructive advice if you have to mention something that's like negative, but not with the, not with the uh, additional facts that are going to get into backbiting. So example would be, again, I'll use the example of work. You are struggling with a toxic boss. It's toxic culture, constantly saying problematic things. They are um, overworking you. They are um, 
that creating problems in your life and so on and so forth. And you now need to find a way. You might discuss that with your, you know, your parents or your spouse or like your good friend. How do I get out of this? But if you now start to mention things about that person that just annoy you, but have nothing to do with the topic that you're looking to solve, you're just like, yeah, he's just like, you know, you just, I don't know what, a, what an example would be, but you find something to mention. She's just like this, or he's just like this. And now you've gotten into backbiting. And now that's, that's, that's impermissible, right? But the constructive aspect is totally fine. Um, complaining here, with your, based on your question about complaining, this is where ultimately there's a level of tawheed called experiential tawheed. So we have tawheed, which is la ilaha illallah, the level of belief. And then you have, so there's no God worthy of worship except Allah. There is no God except Allah. And then there's tawheed, that there's nothing actually happening except it's by Allah's permission. That's another level of la ilaha illallah. And then there's a level of la ilaha illallah that it's all, all coming, to, everything is from Allah. So as someone tries to get to that level of, of experiential tawheed, meaning they're witnessing. So you say, when you say, ashhadu la ilaha illallah, you are saying, I witness that there's no God except Allah. At a higher level, it's like saying, I witness that nothing is happening to me in my life except that it's through Allah. And it's by Allah. And it's through Allah's permission. And it's it's coming as a test. And the people are just means. I think one of the imams here, but a few weeks ago in khutbah said, he's like, see, everybody is like a puppet. And Allah is controlling them. So you ultimately see that everything is coming to us from Allah. And now how do I respond in a way that would have adab with Allah? So over complaining about that is complaining about something that Allah has permitted to happen. But constructive problem solving would be fine. We don't, it's not like bottling it up because the person who really deeply discusses things with their Lord never is bottled up. They're like the most happy people. Because they're just turning, Allah solves the problems. He's the only one who can actually solve it, right? Like our friend can't solve the problem. Our spouse can't solve the problem, right? They're just, they're here, listen, give us some advice. Allah can solve every problem. So, and whoever places their, whoever has taqwa of Allah, Allah will give them an exit strategy out of every single problem, everything. And will provide for them from where they never expected. And whoever places their trust in Allah, Allah is sufficient for them. He says this. Um, in, in Surah Talaq. So this is the mindset. Allah wants us to get to this mindset. That we turn to him and we have taqwa of him in every moment such that he gives us away at our problem. We might not be there. And we're, we're not there, right? We're, 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 we're just trying to get there. As we're trying to get there, we find people who will help us along the path and give us constructive advice, but who don't engage the lower tendencies of the human being to fall into negative talk, backbiting and complaining. Um, and it's just kind of like a balance. If someone might be might be at the point where they they complain a lot, and they just need to reduce the complaining, they don't need to worry about all these other things. But if someone has mastered that and has not stopped complaining, they shouldn't even see it as they're bottling anything up inside. Because I know people I've never heard them ever complain ever, and I don't think they they don't come across at all that they're bottling inside. They're 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 just so in a happy state, and they're in an expansive state, and they're they're in such a good state that it's like there's not even negativity that can enter here. It like tries to come in and the light is powerful, it leaves. That's the state we ultimately want to get to. We just have to figure out on the path where we are and who we kind of talk to and work with to help us get there. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, I know it's getting quite late. So we're just going to um, go ahead. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to come up afterwards. Um, and uh, on the, uh, okay, there's the question online. Yeah, this, this is not relevant to the topic. Um, um, why do people say secret marriages are halal, like from behind the back? Yeah, very few people say that. Um, it's, it's, if someone is saying that, you should really be careful about them. It's, it's going to create fit them. Um, okay. Cool. So we'll, we'll, we'll um, end with this topic, inshallah. So next next week, we'll be covering. So there's a question here about the tricks of shaitan. I'm not going to cover that right now because next week, the entire section is about the tricks of shaitan. So um, I highly advise uh, coming to the next week's session. Um, for the one who's asking this question online. Uh, and then we're going to talk about shaitan, and then we're going to get into the following week, the nafs. And then we're, we'll have covered the main, um, I don't know, enemies is the right word, but the, the main kind of uh, obstructions that come on the spiritual path for someone is for, in terms of creation, in terms of things that are created.
لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم ربنا أعطينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وكنا عذاب النار يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا فتح يا عليم يا رزاق يا وحاب يا شافي يا لطيف يا الله we ask that you pour your love upon us يا الله we ask that you give us light in our hearts and that you guide us يا رب العالمين towards people of goodness and away from anyone who is going to affect us يا الله we are weak before you and we need you and we need to have adab before you we ask that you teach us adab like you taught the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم adab يا رحمن الرحيم we ask that you give us immense nearness to you يا الله we ask that you direct our inner and outer being entirely towards you and that you remove the obstacles on this path and that you allow us to traverse this path with complete ease and that you bring us near near and near to you in every moment in every breath and every step that we take ya Allah ar rahim we ask you for all khair and for all lutf and for all ease and we ask that you remove our doubts and our uncertainties and our anxieties and our worries and our stress and our problems and our sicknesses and our illness and our depression and every other issue that it is that we our beloved community or anyone from our family or our friends or anyone is going through ya Allah ar rahim we ask that you pour your rahmat down upon us and upon our community and upon the muslims ya Allah ar rahim we ask you for everything good the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked for and we ask you for protection from everything evil that he has protection from us sallallahu alaihi wasallam and barakallahu Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah.